We are a family of faith passionately connecting to Christ, His church, His word, and His mission for His glory. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we bow before you this day, and, and uh, God, we acknowledge that you are holy. And Lord, I pray that as your word is preached, God, that you would fill me with your spirit and anoint me to preach your word with power. And I pray that my words would be filled much with Christ and his gospel. I pray, Father, that we would understand the importance of your word this morning. And Lord, I pray that we would give you our undivided attention. And I pray that we would give you soft, pliable hearts. And I pray that your Holy Spirit would conform our hearts to the nature of your character as revealed in your word. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Let's go ahead and open our Bibles this morning to Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. And uh, let me just say something in preparation of reading this text. When I, there's a difference between studying a passage and teaching a passage. And there is getting a word from God. My goal is not just to stand up here and interpret a passage of Scripture. My goal is to pray, find the true meaning of the text, and then get a word from God for this church. Does that make, does that make a difference? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's one thing to have a text and to understand it. But then you have to continue to pray, okay, God, from this text... Give me a word for this congregation. And so I truly believe that God has answered that prayer. And I have a word from the word of God, from God, for you today. After putting the sign, or the title of the sermon on the sign this week, I drove by and I thought, well, that's not very encouraging. I mean, how many people want to come to a church with the sermon title, is tragic consequences. Sign me up, right? But as you well know, I, I don't try to be cute with my titles. I try to just reflect the title from the tone of the text. And the tone is, they, we see some tragic consequences in the Word of God in Hosea 4. This is a warning, and it's a warning to believers. Um, God is warning them against breaking covenant with him. Uh, the nation of Israel has broken covenant with God. Thank God for the remnant who had not. But there was a covenant that had been broke, not on God's part, but on Israel's part. And it was because of their own pride. And as a result of that, not only did God warn them, but God subsequently punished them by taking them into exile. For almost 70 or a little over 70 years in order to discipline them, in order to bring them back to the true worship of God. Make no mistake about it, God created you and me to worship Him. That is what we will be doing throughout all of eternity. We will be worshiping holy God. And that is where true joy is found. True joy and comfort and peace is found when we give God sincere worship. Now, most men that I know, there are a few exceptions, probably, but most of you are like me. And when it comes to building something, the instructions are just a suggestion. Anybody else? When I look at instructions, I look at the picture. That's all I do. I look at the picture, I get an idea, and then I set the, instruction, the, the instructions aside. 
I have found out through trial and error that that is probably not the right thing to do. As a matter of fact, there have been many things that I have put together, whether it be a child's Christmas toy or building something for Kelly. Uh, there have been many things that I have put together that uh, were lacking in structural integrity because I did not follow the instructions. I believe that we live in a day in the life of the church where there are many Christians who lack structural integrity. They're weak, feeble, and prone to fall. Why? Because we have forgotten to read the instructions. And I'm speaking about the Word of God. What we will see in this passage this morning that the nation of Israel have not only forsaken God, but they have forsaken God by forsaking the Word of God. That's what we see here. They have forsaken God's Word. And when we forsake God's Word, it results in tragic consequences. So I'll be quite honest with you this morning. My purpose in this message is for us to return to a sincere love for God by loving His Word. Notice what he says there in Hosea chapter 4 verse 1. He says, Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. How many of you know that's not a good thing? For God to have controversy with you. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. Why? Because they had broken covenant by forsaking the word. Notice what he says. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love or knowledge of God in the land. Why? Because they had forsaken the word. But notice what is in the land. There is swearing and lying and murder and stealing and committing adultery. They break all bonds. They broke covenant. And bloodshed follows bloodshed. Reap what you sow. Verse 3. It also has affected the land. Therefore the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish. And also the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. Yet, let not one contend, and let not one excuse, for with you is my contention, O priest. Wow. He laid the blame on the religious leaders. It's quite a travesty when a religious leader forsakes the word, isn't it? He says in verse 5, you stumble by day. That's what happens when you forsake the word. The prophet also shall stumble with you by night. And I will destroy your mother. Here it is, verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge. They have rejected the word. They have forsaken the word. And what does God say? I reject you from being a priest to me. And since you have forgotten the law, there it is. I've got that highlighted in red in my Bible. Since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. The more they, they increase, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. They feed on sin of my people. They are greedy for their iniquity. And it shall be like people, like priests. I will punish them for their deeds. I will repay them for their deeds. They shall eat, but not be satisfied. They shall play the whore, but not multiply. Because they have forsaken the Lord to cherish whoredom, wine, and new wine. 
which take away the understanding. My people inquire of a piece of wood, and their walking staff gives them oracles. For the spirit of whoredom has led them astray, and they have left their God to play the whore. They sacrifice on top of mountains and burn offerings on hills and under oak and popular and terbinath. Because their shade is good. Therefore your daughter plays the whore and your bride commits adultery. I will not punish your daughters when they play the whore, nor your brides when they commit adultery. Why? For the men themselves, the spiritual leaders, for the men themselves go aside with prostitutes and sacrifice with cult prostitutes. And a people without understanding shall come to ruin. Though you play the whore, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. Enter not into Gilgal, nor go up to beth and swear not as the Lord lives. Like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture? Notice this, verse 17. I have this highlighted in red as well. Ephraim is joined to idols. And listen to what God says. Leave him alone. Isn't that a sobering thought? That they had fallen so far in their spiritual harlotry and their hearts had become so hardened that God said, leave them alone. Don't preach to them. Don't call them to repent. Don't warn them. They want their idols. We'll let them have their idols. It's a tragic thing when God chooses to leave an unrepentant sinner alone. We need His discipline to keep us holy. Verse 18. When their drink is gone, they give themselves to whoring. Their rulers dearly love shame. A wind has wrapped them in wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Hmm. For those of you who like to follow along, my first observation this morning is simply, as it pertains to the nation of Israel, the word of God was forsaken. The word of God was forsaken. How do we know that? Look at what he says there in verse 1. There is no faithfulness, no devotion, no knowledge of God. They had forsaken God's Word. Do you know that when we forsake the Word, we forsake God? Let that sink in for a moment. When we forsake God's Word, we forsake God because it is God's Word. When the Word is forsaken... It always produces God-forsakenness. Why? Because, beloved, this is the Word of God. It is His self-revelation to us. And if God would not have chosen to reveal Himself to us, we would not know God. For there's none who seek after God. So we praise to God. We praise God today for His self-revelation in an act of mercy and grace that God Himself, the Creator of heaven and earth, chose to reveal Himself to us. J.I. Packer said, Christianity is a religion that rests on God's self-revelation. If God had not chosen to reveal Himself to us, there would be no Christian faith. Nobody would know the truth about God. No one would be able to relate to God in a personal way if God had not acted first to reveal Himself to us. And how has God chosen to reveal Himself to us? Through 66 books of the Bible. The Bible says there in that passage I just read to you, 
My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Verse 6. Why did they lack knowledge? Because they had forsaken the law of God. They had forsaken God's self-revelation. And because they had forsaken God's self-revelation, they had no knowledge of God. But God has chosen to reveal Himself to us through what is known as special revelation. Through 66 books of the Bible. 39 Old Testament, 27 New Testament. The Old Testament books of the Bible are looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. Anticipating the Messiah's first coming. The New Testament... The last 27 books is a reflection back upon the finished work of Christ. His death, burial, and resurrection. And the effect that it has on our lives in the present as we look to the future of the Lord's second coming. So we have our Bibles. And from one standpoint, the Bible is Scripture. And the word Scripture just literally means writings. Jesus himself referred to the Bible as the Father's heavenly instruction or the heavenly Father's written instruction. Now, Christ, of course, was referring to the Old Testament. And Christ referred to the 39 books of the Old Testament as the heavenly Father's written instruction. Paul also affirmed this about his Old Testament scripture when he said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that all scripture is God-breathed. And then Peter tells us in 2 Peter that all scripture is inspired by God. Men who were carried along by the Holy Spirit recorded the word of God. Now listen to me, beloved. We know something of the deep mystery of the Incarnation. We know that when Jesus Christ came, Jesus Christ was both fully God and fully man. I would say to you that there is a sense in which the Scripture itself is fully God and fully man. How so? It is the Word of God. And the same thing that could be said about the Old Testament, it is true of the New Testament. This is the Word of God. This book and the words on on the pages of this book find their origin in God Himself. Divinely inspired. But God used human authors. A book that's written over a 15 to 1600 year period with 40 different authors from diverse backgrounds. But from Genesis to Revelation, they tell the same story of the unfolding of God's redemptive history. How can a book that was written over that long a period with that many different authors tell the same story? Because ultimately there's one author who is God. But God used human authors. He used their personalities. He used their backgrounds. He used their education. He used their writing style. And God did not dictate the word to them as if they were zombies or robots. God did not dictate the word to them. God superintended his word. He inspired them. He illumined them. He gave them interpretation as they wrote the word of God down. So God is the author of this book, but yet he used human authors to record it. But God superintended it. He watched over his word to make sure that everything that is written in this Bible is the word of God itself. That's why we believe in a fancy word known as the plenary verbal inspiration of Scripture, which means that we believe that every every word of the Bible is the word of God. And when we forsake this book, we forsake God. 
because it is the Word of God. And listen, God has gifted every Christian with the ability to understand the Bible. At the moment of your salvation, you were indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives revelation. The Holy Spirit gives illumination. The Holy Spirit gives interpretation. The Holy Spirit gives application, which produces sanctification. And this is the proof of glorification. You want me to read that again? This is, I wrote this down this morning in my office as I was finishing up the fine-tuning. Remember, you have the Holy Spirit in you if you are a Christian. And the Spirit does what? He gives us revelation. He gives us illumination. He gives us interpretation. He gives us application, which produces sanctification. And this is the proof, proof of future glorification. So every Christian, as Packer said, every Christian has the right and the duty to read, to meditate upon, memorize, and to interpret the Scripture. Now I know that there are passages in the Bible that seem to be surrounded by clouds. But I will submit to you that every main point of the Scripture is thoroughly clear. And when you come to those passages that have clouds around them, how do you interpret them? You use Scripture to interpret Scripture. Let Scripture interpret Scripture. In other words, go to those passages that are more clear to interpret the ones that have a cloud surrounding them. But make no mistake about it, don't sit there and say that you can't understand the Bible because you have the Holy Spirit and every major point of the Bible is thoroughly transparent. And it is your right and your duty to know God through His Word. Notice I didn't say to know the Word of God. Because the chief end is not to know the Word of God. The chief end is to know God. But what happens when the word is forsaken? I told you that my first point as it relates to the nation of Israel is that when the word of God that the word of God was forsaken. Second point, when the word of God is forsaken, sin abounds. When the word of God is forsaken, sin abounds. Is that not what we clearly see in the text? Go back to verses, look at verse 2. Verse 1 tells us there's no knowledge, no love, no faithfulness. But what was there? Swearing, lying, murder, stealing, committing of adultery. When the word of God is forsaken, God is forsaken and sin abounds. In other words, there's a progression here of moral depravity debased leadership, personal emptiness, and ruin on a nationwide scale. That's what we see. They had forsaken the word and they drifted into moral depravity. Even to the extent that their leadership was debased. Even their prophets and their priests. There was a personal emptiness in the people and there was ruin on a nationwide scale. That's what happens when sin abounds. What does the psalmist tell us in Psalms 119, verses 9 through 11? He says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. With my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. God has given his us his word as self-revelation that we might know him that we might hide God's word in our heart that we might not sin against God let us learn from the nation of Israel today 
They had forsaken the Word of God. Knowledge of God comes through Scripture. Of course, we can get general revelation from God by looking at creation, but you cannot be saved unless you have special revelation that comes from the Word. Knowing that God exists will not save you. Knowing that God exists and He gave His only begotten Son to die upon the cross for the sins of humanity in order to reconcile us back to Himself will save you. And where do we find this out? We find it from the Word. And not just part of the Word, but the whole of the Word. All 66 books point to salvation in Jesus Christ. Some knowledge is intellectual. There are many people who have intellectual knowledge of the Word. Knowledge is also volitional. Trusting, obeying, worshiping by my own free will. And then thirdly, true knowledge is moral. Practicing justice and love. I say to my abolition brothers and sisters in here, do you know why our fight is so desperate to end abortion? It's because... There's no knowledge of God. The first thing is intellectual. we got to know the truth about God. Volitional, that we have to trust God. Moral, we have to practice justice and love. Do you know what happens in your life when you begin to forsake God's Word? Those things will begin to decrease. When you begin to forsake God's Word, you will begin to drift and slide into moral depravity. You will stop trusting God and that His way is best. And ultimately, you'll lose sight of who God really is, which results in ultimately no knowledge of God. What is true knowledge? It's all three of those things. It's intellectual, it's volitional, it's moral. A true Christian is characterized by knowing God, trusting God, obeying God, worshiping God, practicing justice and righteousness and love, all in the name of Christ. But if we forsake the word, beloved, we will be just like Israel. When we neglect the word, we will see a complete digression concerning true knowledge it will affect us intellectually volitionally and morally we see this in verse 12 I'm sorry verses 1 and 2 and where did God put the blame God says he has controversy with them but where does he put the blame look at verse 4 yet let no one contend and let no one excuse for with you is my contention O priest The responsibility is on the priest. How so? Because they have not been feeding the people the law of God. They have not been feeding them the word. And because the priest had forsaken the word, we read these words. Verse 6. My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. Why? Because there was no word. I could say to you the same thing today. Why are people so weak? It's because there is a lack of the knowledge of God being preached from the pulpits across our land. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest, God says. And since you have forgotten the law of your God, I will also forget your children. There it is. They had forgotten the word. And why did they forget it? Because the priests weren't preaching it. Can we all be honest this morning and just say that the desire for sin can be almost insatiable at times in our lives? Anybody else? But we are called to hunger and to thirst for righteousness. 
In the days of King Josiah, the word of God had been lost. And when you study your Old Testament scripture, you find that when the word of God was lost, the people drifted into moral depravity and emptiness and all types of licentiousness and evil against God. But they found the word. And when Josiah read the word, and he saw how far the people had drifted away from the word, from God, He cried out and confessed the sins of his nation. The Bible says, when the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes in an action of repentance and humility. Listen. And when he responded appropriately to the word, he led the people to do likewise. And guess what? There was reformation and restoration. But when you oppose the word, Pharaoh opposed the word and he lost his entire army to the high water of the Red Sea. Achan opposed the word and lost his life and the life of his entire family. Saul opposed the word and lost his anointing. Listen, brothers and sisters, we are in a battle against sin and evil, and we are to wield the Word. It is the sword of the Spirit. It is our weapon against evil. A few weeks ago, I preached a sermon about when God is forgotten. And I told you in that sermon that when we forget God, I'll add to it, by forsaking the Word, compromise sets in, wickedness abounds, and judgment is inevitable. This is what happens when we set our Bibles aside. With the Bible, we honor God. With the Bible, we win over sin. With the Bible, we defeat the daily attacks of the enemy. With the Bible, we grow in grace, strength, and holiness. With the Bible, we become better citizens, husbands, and fathers. With the Bible, we are like the tree that's planted beside the streams of water, which yields fruit in seasons, and it leaves never wither. But without the Bible, sin abounds. Without the Bible, we trample underfoot the blood of Christ. Without the Bible, we fail to walk in love. With the Bible, we walk by the Spirit. Without the Bible, we carry out the desires of the flesh. Without the Bible, we are unfaithful to the souls of men and women and children. Without the Bible, we fail to be To speak of God with outspoken zeal for His glory. Without the Bible, we bring dishonor to His great name. Without the Bible, we will be impure in our thoughts and our words and our deeds. With the Bible, we care for souls. With the Bible, we will be outspoken for Christ. With the Bible, we honor His great name. With the Bible, we will be holy in word and thought and deed. With the Bible, we will be weaned from evil. With the Bible, we will be mortified to this world. With the Bible, we will be ready for our departure at the coming of Christ. Let us look here at this chapter and we see what God's thought is of those who neglect the word. Who compares them to whores. And those who lead them have a spirit of whoredom. Listen beloved, God is holy. And even though he may pass over sin for a time, it will ultimately be punished. If you are a Christian and you are neglecting God by neglecting his word, God will punish you to bring you back to himself. If you are lost and you refuse to repent, God will punish you with divine retribution. Second Samuel 7.14 says, I will be a father to him and he will be a son to me. When he commits iniquity, I will correct him with the rod of men and the strokes of the sons of men. 
So not only, listen, not only had they forsaken the word and abounded in sin, God punished their sin. God punished their sin. We see that there in verse 7. The more they increase, the more they sinned against me. I will change their glory into shame. I will feed on the sin of my people. They are greedy for their iniquity. And it shall be like people, like priests. I will punish them for their ways. I will repay them for their deeds. Because, verse 10, because they had forsaken the Lord. He tells us why they had forsaken the Lord. When you look at the latter part of verse 12, because the spirit of whoredom had led them astray. They had left God to play the war. They had forsaken God by forsaking His word. And as a result, they had digressed into moral depravity. They were still going through the acts of worship. Look at what he says in verse 13. That they sacrifice on tops of mountains and they offer burnt offerings on the hills under oak and these different places. But what does he say? Look at verse 19, the latter part. They shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Yes, they go through the act of worship. But God says, I do not receive their worship. And one day, the act of worship that they offer up to me in hypocrisy will be their shame. Listen, beloved, God does not take it lightly when we forsake His Word. Why? Because it destroys our souls. And He's a Heavenly Father who loves us. Even in this warning, every warning that we read in the Scripture is an act of the grace of God to prepare our minds and hearts to repent and return to Him. God punishes only after He has warned His people. And disciplined his people. And they have remained unwilling to repent. Then God punishes. And as I told you before. He tells them. Enter not into Gilgal. Verse 15. Nor go up to Bethaven. You know where Bethaven? That's Bethel. But God refers to it as Beth Haven, which is the place of pride. And swear not as the Lord lives. Like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them? What? Feed them? Like a lamb in a broad pasture? Now they've joined idols. Hosea, leave them alone. God giving them over to the idolatrous lust of their own hearts, which would result in their shame, according to verse 19. Let me say this as we draw to a conclusion. There are those who seek knowledge of God through the Word for the sake of knowledge. If you seek knowledge just for the sake of knowledge, that's merely curiosity. That's just, you're just being curious. That's where some are. They seek knowledge just for the sake of knowledge. That's curiosity. There are others who seek knowledge to be known by others. Oh, they want to be known for how much of the Bible they know. That is vanity. And then there are those who seek knowledge in order to serve God. To know God. And that is love. So I ask you, as it relates to the Word of God in your life, have you forsaken God by forsaking His Word? Has your knowledge simply been curiosity or vanity? Or can you honestly say, 
that you seek God through the Word because you love God and want to serve God. It was Charles Spurgeon who said, The Lord can do great things for an obedient people. When His people walk in the light of His countenance and maintain unsold holiness, the joy of consolation that He yields them are beyond conception. The Lord does great things for obedient people. When they walk in the light of His countenance. My prayer this morning, and I hope that it will be yours. Father, let me never forget that I have an eternal duty to love, honor, and obey. And you are infinitely worthy. Our God is worthy of our love, honor, and obedience because He gave His Son that we might be redeemed from the power of sin and the punishment of sin. The very presence of sin I am thankful this morning that God has given me His Word. And I'm thankful that through this Word, I can learn of God's love for me, with that, which is without question, because He gave His Son for me, to die for me, to save me, to redeem me, to reconcile me to God. He drew me unto Himself. He brought me to repentance and granted me faith. And He saved my soul. And He will do the same thing for every person in this room who lacks true knowledge of God. Do you truly know God? Or do you just know about God? Do you have a love for His Word and a desire to obey? Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? If not, would you come to the Lord this morning and be saved? Would you turn and give your life to Christ to be forgiven, to live your life for His glory? And for those of us who are saved, may we never forget our eternal duty to know God through His Word, to love, honor, and to obey God. I say to us men and women, it's time that we stop setting the instructions aside in our private lives. Don't forsake the word. Why? Because there are tragic consequences. I'm going to ask if you would to bow with me this morning in prayer. You have heard the gospel and the call to respond. So here in a moment when I ask you to stand, those of you in need of salvation, you come and seek one of our pastors out. You seek me out. Let us pray for you right now. It is that important. It is that urgent. Eternity is at stake. Don't leave here trampling underfoot the blood of Christ because you have rejected him. You come and receive him and be saved. And those of us who are saved, let us say, Oh, Heavenly Father, I have an eternal duty to love, honor, and obey. And you are worthy. Thank you for your word. And thank you for Jesus and his death for me upon the cross. Christ's name I pray. Amen. Would you stand and come as the Lord leads? You come. Hey, we want to say thank you for checking us out on YouTube. Thank you for listening to the sermon. 
And if you have any questions about the content of that sermon or even about salvation, uh, please contact us on the website that's listed there on the screen. We would love to hear from you, also be able to speak with you, and perhaps even answer any questions that you may have. God bless. Keep tuning in.